as the world begins to emerge from the cave of the 21st century and opens its eyes onto the suffering from centuries of injustice and the bastardization of what it means to be free, the new Nomos podcast is a call. A call for a new beginning. A call for the new men and the new women that yearn to be truly free. A call for us to fulfill our destiny. A call for a new Nomos on the earth. Welcome to the New Nomos Podcast. I'm Abdallah Dutton, inviting you to join me on this journey of discovery to define what the New Nomos is and what we need to get there. A few years ago, I was shown this video called In Shadow, A Modern Odyssey. I remember being captivated by it in the first 15 or 20 seconds. I watched it through and as I and as it progressed I became more and more blown away by the images in the sequence all leading up to the finale which was just beautiful and after watching it the first time I watched it again and again because at the time I was doing a study into Wagner's ring cycle and I felt the ending tapped into one of the key themes in the ring cycle. Fast forward a couple of years to 2020, when we were in the thick of the COVID lockdowns, and there were images after images on the news of hospital beds, etc., etc. I remembered having seen that image in this film, but I could not remember the name of it. And I searched for hours and hours on Google certain that I had watched this short film, and certain that I would find it. And eventually I did, and then went to share it all over my social media, all over Instagram, and my WhatsApps, etc, etc. And at that point, I was doing a study on a book by Dr. Ian Dallas called The Ten Symphonies of Gorka Koenig. And on watching it again, I felt that I wanted to share the gems that I had received from that book with the director of this film who had given me such gems through his artwork. So I went out on a quest to get in contact with Lubomir Azov to send him a copy of the book, which I did, adding a handwritten note, thanking him once again and asking him whether he would be willing to do an interview on In Shadow on my podcast. So here we are with Lubomir, Without further ado, I present to you episode 35, In Shadow, A Modern Odyssey and the Ten Symphonies of Gorka Koenig. I've been looking forward to speaking to you. I think um, sort of the, the, the gracious nature with which you approached me and, you know, you sent, me, you sent me the book, which I read. Have you read the whole thing? I did, yeah. Wow. Okay, wicked. Yeah. That book changed my life. And I always carry a few copies with me. And whenever I meet like interesting people, I'm like, read this book. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, man, I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on it as well. But mm -hmm. how was Peru? Peru was excellent. It was a much needed um, haven, a much needed break from Canada and what's been happening in Canada, as well as the, the whole COVID madness yeah and uh it, it provided my my partner and i um ju just a beautiful natural simple life a place that we can relax our nervous systems uh regroup and really focus on what mattered most which is connection to to spirit to god to our innermost self to nature mm. keeping things simple focusing on on our our offering our talents our gifts and honing those and just being with good people it was Amazing. nice being around the the Quechua people of the mountains, and you know they've been there for so many for centuries, for millennia, and the mountains themselves, and the the way that nature is revered and and is, you know, um, their ceremonies and other ways of of showing of communing with the beings around us, the beings of meaning the mountains and others. So, 
um, without going into too much detail, I think it was very good for my for my soul. And here I am back in Canada, ready to go. <laughs> amazing, man. That's so amazing. Yeah. You just because when you sent me that email, it reminded me of the the book that I I think I even sent you. I think I mentioned it in in one email by can never remember his name. The, the the confessions of an economic hitman right john perkins yeah but he wrote this book in 1996 on his journey to the amazon and it's before he kind of took off with the the economic hitman oh, I see. and it's just talking about his journey to the amazon and meeting with these ancient healers there and then he asked them he's like how can i take this back to my people in america and he said words to the effect of you can't bring your people from america here and he got mm. he got together a grouping of i think it was like six or seven doctors and he brought them to the amazon it was it was in peru i'm almost certain and they had this like amazing experience in peru with these traditional healers and like these doctors minds were just completely blown by the fact that the way that they heal works you know and this is ancient oh. wisdom and ancient knowledge that works so you can have all the drugs and medicines and vaccines and this that and the other but there's another way and it's yeah in tune with nature and i mean i don't want to compare one thing's better than the other but i mean it's in tune with nature <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely you know? yeah yeah wow that's really amazing that you're there man well, wow. mm. yeah, yeah. So I'd like to, I mean, before I even touch on In Shadow, which I think is just an absolutely monumental piece of art. It is so brilliant. I remember when I first saw it, I literally sent the link to every single person on my WhatsApp list. I was like, you have to watch this. You have to watch this. And that was in 20... 17 i think and then when COVID hit <laughs> i watched it again because i remembered the one scene with all of the the hospital beds together and i was like and i couldn't remember the name of the video and i searched and searched and searched on google and eventually i found it and then i just like went mental with it again and sent it to all my <laughs> whatsapp contacts all over again i was like look this guy look what he's well, look what he's saying um but I wanted to kind of ask you before even getting onto that is like, how did you begin your journey with animation? Yeah, well, I had a natural pull toward it, toward the visual medium. And um, it's, it's, I had no plan B when I went to college for it. Mm. There was just nothing else that appealed to me. And I had this weird, strange, hard headedness, you know, my dad and my family wanted me to pursue a traditional, um, a respectable path in university with with you know a foundational knowledge there <laughs> and and i i don't know like something in me was like no absolutely not and uh, and this this sort of um i've also f always felt these waves of of sentimentality emotion and um whether it's vigor tragedy uh joy these waves of um, emotions coming through me when i would fantasize and dream up story stories Mm. specifically in a visual way and we find ourselves at this time uh in our existence where we have this medium of film you know which is used for good and bad <laughs> and it inspires and it also programs it does many things uh but but the the, the mix of of, of mo a moving picture with sound um i think offers so much potential for for storytelling and for diving deep into the symbolic realm into our inner world and in the world of the world of how we relate to each other and 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 those things just always appeal to me and um i something i i have a knack for drawing uh, i didn't go to film school i don't know why animation pulled me more i think it was something about the tactile nature of creating with my hand creating a, a world from scratch that appealed to me and uh, it's something about the aesthetic of drawings. They're just, you know, it's just my thing. My soul jives with that. So, <laughs> wow, yeah. And how old were you when you started like drawing? Um, I 
Man, all the way back since I was, you know, as early as I can remember, I was drawing. I was mostly copying other things, copying a lot of like animals, jungles, dinosaurs, and, you know, things that kids do. Um, I, I didn't really practice throughout high school. And in fact, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. And when I applied to uh, to animation school, I didn't get in twice to the school that I wanted to get into. Wow. And uh, despite that, I, I went to a different, like a, a B college, you know, like a low, like a, what was considered to be college. And, and uh, yeah, just did my thing and kept going. So I was tested in a way twice. I was tested to like, turn back, do not go through the door. Mm. <laughs> And um, some something in me was like, no, I am going through, and it's happening. So it's so amazing because it's. I remember the first thing that I ever wrote in my journal. So it was somebody advised me to to keep a journal, and the first thing that I wrote in it was, I was having lunch with my godfather, and he said, "There comes a time in a man's life when he has to act, and he knows he has to act." And if he doesn't act, he will always regret it. Mm. In shadow, I mean, how did you even begin to plot that? I mean, it's it is monumental. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah, um, it started coming up with a few episodes of uh, visuals in my head whenever I'd read certain news lines, uh, headlines. Um, read articles, certain examinations of the world, and I was exploring the the underworld of, of, of our world, sort of the parapolitical aspect of how things really get done, what the, what the certain currents and forces behind the scenes are that that really orchestrate uh, certain certain events, certain aspects. Which, you know, at first, it's funny. At, at, at first view, it's it's funny. There's this knee jerk reaction by the uh, so called intellectuals to whenever they hear this kind of language, they sort of like revert back into like, oh, that's not that's not very uh, sophisticated to speak about people controlling things, etc. <laughs> um, and we've reached a point now where it's actually very unsophisticated not to. Yeah, and it's that's very clear, but. But at that point, I was I was doing this dark unveiling in a way, which was uh, shocking to me and, and and disturbing and very interesting as well, and very stimulating and almost the only thing I needed to do at that point. And I had reached a, a state in which I felt somewhat alienated from a lot of the people around me, including my family, uh, stuck in this sort of like dark cave as I was moving through it and, and re renegotiating my relationship to reality and the history and the facts that I, I thought I had um, I was part of and this lineage of, of history as we had been presented it and even current events as we had been seen them and as that was getting reoriented I felt as I was feeling more and more alienated um, words would not do justice to what I was feeling and sensing as a holistic new model that was emerging uh, mm -hmm. in front of me and, and you know, granted, that model was was somewhat dark, and and it's not fully representative of of the world as it is. But it's it's an aspect, it's a view which is very important to to see, in my my opinion. And so I started seeing as I was doing my research, I started seeing visuals that accompanied um, this you know this research. And these visuals were just very simple, succinct examples of the essence of some of the things I was seeing. And, and gradually, I was inspired by music to to piece together these these scenes into a tapestry that that sort of navigated and took a journey, took the audience through uh, what modern life is, and you could say Western life, but 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 there's sort of a as the monoculture of the world expands, uh, I would say somewhat world culture. You know, many people can see themselves in in this movie or, or see what's happening around them in it. So, so yeah, I started plotting it um, with that inspiration. And then I sort of like then using my, my left brain started charting out a logical course through the various institutions and behavioral pathways up to the, you know, the in traditional storytelling, the, the, the collapse within the climax and then the rebirth at the very end. Mm. So that's, that's generally how it happened. When did you actually finish the whole piece? It was a few weeks before I released it, so I would say in uh, late October of 2017. 2017. And as yeah. far as I'm concerned, there is a lot of prophetic stuff in there. I mean, you, you're, 
I mean, it's the natural, one could say it was the natural trajectory of things, but I mean, I believe that you were tapping into a very deep well that, I mean, like the scenes specifically, like that one scene that I was talking about earlier where you've got all those hospital beds and then from that, mm -hmm. you, you know, you've got juxtaposed to that, you've got these, you know, I mean, powers behind the scenes making deals with injections going into babies and drugs being thrown down a child's mouth and it's it's harrowing but it's our reality mm -hmm. but i really i really felt that there was uh it, it 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 was almost prophetic i don't want to say it is or was prophetic but there's aspects to it and i want to know where was that inspiration? I mean, there's the, there's the outward thing of that, you know, what you're seeing around you in the world and the political things and, and people behind the events that are happening. But where was this spring of inspiration coming from? Mm. Yeah, there, you know, I've been trying to make sense of it as well since I released it and since I've been getting the, kind of the feedback and reception from the audience. And there's there are a few elements. There was just the, the raw inspiration of 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 that had some anger in it and by anger i just mean the force that wants to move outwardly mm. to to free something out of being bound so that's just a natural healthy sort of anger you know it's not and, and so that was a real driving force which made me uh and maybe not anger maybe it's something more refined it was just a, a force that's maybe you could call it somewhat of a warrior force if you know mm. if you can attach that to an artist and i think you can i think there's a valid point to be made there and within the process, using, again, my knowledge, that which I had learned and understood, thought it to have understood, I started mapping it out logically. But within all that, something was weaving itself. And I only found that out later as I was finishing it and, and in hindsight. And the way I make sense of it is that if we show up in whatever industry or art or, you know, skill that we, we, we uh, are versed in, if we show up to it with enough mileage and, and and developed skill already and enough earnestness honesty and and an openness to to be to be led to find what what is most apt and applicable to express our idea i feel that then the muse the the, the greater spirit of of, of 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 synchronistic forces of of resonant forces imbue us and work through us and with us and i think that's what happened within shadow um because as, as I was trying to map out the, the most succinct way of, without being too cheesy, which is kind of difficult with art and, and expressing some spiritual ideas or spirit, you know, ideas of decay, I was looking for the most apt and symbol symbols that were cross cultural that didn't didn't stop anyone and make it this. I didn't want anyone to discard it because they recognized the symbol that was maybe they were averse to or had preconceived notions about. So I had to use things that were universal very simple direct that could easily be understood and and so those things are sort of like kind of coming as epiphanies and and were weaving themselves through me and i don't you know i don't don't really take ownership or claim ownership of them like i was working with something and this you know the prophetic stuff that you you talk about is even 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 things that i look back into and people have uh, have derived greater meaning that I had intended for certain shots or certain sequences. I could see in hindsight that again, the symbolic realm, the archetypal realm was moving through me because I was, I think I was showing up honestly, uh, mm. with an earnest, uh, earnest mission, not for myself, but for, for the art and just to, to really express a message that I thought was urgent and important. Um, and authentic. And think, oh, thank, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I think one thing that I do feel watching it is like it's so authentic. It's like, is was it just you working on it? If you did, you put that whole thing together by yourself, or did you have a team? I had a I had a small team, so I had two um, two guys helping me with the compositing. And just in technical terms, the compositing is, you know, I rolled storyboarded um, the whole thing. I, I created all the elements, all the illustrations are mine, but it's not really animated compositing basically just grabs all the elements that i've you know i have created and under my direction we moved the camera through them and that way we were able to do it for almost no budget other than you know my my labor and the labor of, of the mm. two gentlemen 
who helped me there in, you know, in the credits. So they, without them, the short would not be possible. Um, so yeah, that's, they, they, they helped out with that. But I mean, it's, it's your creation. This is your message. Yeah. It's your authentic expression. Yeah. In terms of authorship. Yeah. It was, it was completely my vision. How did you get, how did you choose the music? Cause it's so dramatic. It's like, and it just, yeah. it, it's building, building, building up to this crescendo at the end. It's like, but how did you get hold of that music and where did you find it? Yeah. So a, a friend of mine in town and him and his uh, music partner made it for me. And I had a, I basically wrote the whole film to uh, a tune by carbon lice, carbon based life forms. They're a ambient electronic duo from Sweden, legendary, incredible music. Oh. One of their songs, it's uh, called MOS. 6105 or something like that <laughs> and i listened to that song like hundreds of times as i was downloading the the images for for the short right. and um it wasn't tenable for me to to use that song i needed something longer so that was sort of our starting point and the melancholy and the progressive sort of uh movement towards something building uh was present in that song that i wanted to really capture with our new track and uh that's yeah that's where that's how it that's how it happened so was the piece of music written and created for in shadow yeah yeah it's an original score oh wow I just want to mention something in case um, this is sort of like on, on the side, but I just found out someone unfortunately has registered that song as their own. I just recently uh, used Shazam on it because the musicians didn't register it. So now it's uh, if anyone's listening that has any uh, pull in the in the music in industry or knows how I can get th those you know those rights, I would love to hear from you. But that's a little tragic side note. Yeah, hopefully nothing comes of it, but I just wanted to put that out there. Well, the last episode I just released was uh, with a friend of mine, and we were looking into the life and works of W.B. Yeats, the Irish poet. Mm. And there's one play that he wrote called On Bailey's Strand. And in that play, he's really exploring the idea of tragic joy. So it's that you have this tragic hero, but even when he's facing up to the tragedy at the end of the play, there's there's joy in the acceptance of the fact that he is a tragic hero. It's it's really mm. it's a really interesting theme. So yeah, mm. maybe maybe it's not n all tragic. Maybe there's some gift there waiting yeah. for you. <laughs> no, you're right. I was I was too dramatic. Actually I I I, I don't know, something in me there was an impulse to share that and it's not important at all and no, nor does it bother me all, all, all is good but yeah thank you thank you for that <laughs> reassurance i appreciate it <laughs> what i see you are depicting in in shadow is the state of the modern human in this society that we find ourselves in what i understand is that that is just a symptom of a much bigger system that has been actively working to destroy the humanness of the human and leading us towards being more robotic because being more robotic is easier to control. And that has never been the case, or I mean, if you look historically, that's never been the case with the human creature because the human creature is a divine being it has it has connection to the divine essence of the world and whether you want to look f at that from a religious perspective or a mystical perspective or a kind of ancient perspective we are divine creatures and to remove the divine from us is highly oppressive what I love about In Shadow, I mean, um, one of the things I love about In Shadow is it, it depicts this kind of state of the modern human. And what I've been working on is looking at, if we take the premise that what we see outwardly is just a reflection of what's inside us, 
And if we see oppression outside, it means we have oppression inside. How do we then flip it over so that we see freedom outside and are therefore free inside? And from my research and my study and what I'm kind of putting together, I've found that there's like five traits which need to be nurtured in the human in order to release that wild spirit and energy that the 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 globe the world the human creature needs today and that is spontaneity enthusiasm passion virility and trust how do we nurture those characteristics so that given the first 11 minutes of in shadow we can then get to that last two minutes where we are able to revive ourselves and let that spirit come out and find that love and that love and that connection to create a new generation of people you know and mm -hmm. i think that that is it's so i i don't want to it's just so beautifully put i mean the way you've put it all together is and connecting that the, the I mean, the divine energy from the top and from the bottom and coming together and, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know how many times I've watched it. I like, it's it's just yeah. so brilliant. I'm on, Let me just take a step back. I'm I, yeah. Honestly, I'm so honored to be having this conversation with you. And thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. No, yeah, I, me too. I, I'm really enjoying this, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you've obviously put together this ending, and I've, I, I'm seeing it from my perspective, and I'm understanding. Well, I have, I'm reflecting on my understanding of it. But um, how do you see th what you're portraying in the ending in an existent in our existential reality? Like, how do you foresee the human creature really like breaking free of this trap and emerging in 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 their fullness? Mm -hmm. Well, if we had if we had to figure it out on our own, it'd be extremely difficult, and who knows, could be hopeless. But I think we're 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 being helped by this whole mystery that's unfolding around us, both dark and light. And um, while we can go through modalities, and we we can, and and certain other aspects of the trajectory of growth and unfolding and self actualization and spiritualizing the body and this, et cetera, and bringing bringing the divine on this earth to to, you know, spiritualize matter. I think that basically um, we're in a place right now where kind of where we are sh being shown indirectly what we need to do. So the pressure that the world is under right now, and, you know, you and I haven't actually spoken about the details of that, and I don't know where you stand with it, but I, I assume we, we, we see similarly and some of these things, but, you know, the technocratic push, the sort of like centralization of a lot of power of, of control of resources, the coercion of human beings to be to, to alter their bodies, etc. All of these challenges, uh, some of them seem very horrific to some people. To other people, they just seem just fine. Something that they're absolutely willing to change their humanity for. But these pressures are asking us for new solutions because we all know that we don't change until we it's too late, right? And we don't change until there's pressure or hurt or pain. And, you know, that's that's kind of like everyone kind of comes to that conclusion. Um, and some of us do, though. There are heroic spirits who are like, no, I'm just going to actually go for for the summit of the mountain. I'm just going to climb it because mm. I seek greatness and I seek to to realize my spirit and to con commune and connect with the divine. Mm. But, but many of us are, are here in the situation where we're being shown through the adversity, through the through the adversary that is in our way that is trying to so overtly and obviously squash what what it means to be human is asking us to upgrade to a new harmonic and to balance our forces to uh, the forces within us to summon dormant energies to summon forces and to grow and harness and and, and sharpen uh aspects within us uh, just so we can deal with the situation so that means uh many things it means being honest and true to ourselves because the more we lie to ourselves, the more easily we can be lied to from the outside. And we're seeing that with a lot of mm -hmm. what's going on. It means being in good and right relationship with, with our resources, with our money, with our work and our purpose and those around us because community is more and more important. Mm -hmm. It means being in touch and, and being sensitive to earth and her rhythms and, and her energies and her power. 
uh, because we have to, because, you know, that's another thing. We may have to make our own food because the, of the, the malicious nature of these greater centralizing forces that are imposing their will and their synthetic sort of view on everything that they touch. Mm. And, um, and so in a way, I'm sorry, there was a few ways I could have answered your question, but I feel <laughs> this train of, this train of inquiry sort of excited me. Yeah. So I yeah. just went on it. Maybe we can like revert back and like keep, keep, keep poking this from different ways, but uh, I think I'll just leave it at, at that. Yeah, because I mean, Ezra Pound, the, 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 the great poet, he saw the main problem as usury. And he called it contra natura, which is like against nature. You can't just keep creating money. Like the, the, the way that the current system is set up, you can just keep making multiples and multiples and multiples and put on interest. But the interest itself is against nature because you can't have increase in perpetuum. Because, <laughs> I mean, if you study economics, which I have, the first thing they teach you is that economics is the study of scarcity in a finite world and now they have created a system on top of that which is you can endlessly keep creating money i don't want to go into the 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 ins and outs of it from like the economic perspective i've discussed it in other episodes but what's happened over the last 400 years is this this horse has just lost the reins and it's gone out of control I mean, it was the the system itself. You know, it cannot last forever. It is unsustainable. You cannot keep creating more and more money because the more money you create, the the less it's worth. And you can do all the financial engineering you like, but you know, it can only last for another yeah. generation or so. And what's happening on the ground is that everyone's getting screwed, and everyone's yeah. the, all the money in everyone's pocket. I mean, whether that you're talking about people on the ground in Nairobi in Kenya or in South Africa or in the United Kingdom or Canada or the US or wherever you are, everyone's money is becoming worth less and less and less. Everyone's getting this paid the same amount. The prices of goods are skyrocketing wherever you are in the world. And it's just we're at this point in time where it cannot continue like this. And the people have to start waking up and raising up and creating new solutions. Yeah. And not for the betterment of anything, but just for the survival of the human being as a human yeah. in their humanness, you know, and like you said, in connection with nature and in connection with the rhythm of the, of the, of the earth and, you know, in community. And, and I totally agree with everything you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, what you're bringing up is, is yeah, probably one of the biggest keys. It's, it's the dark spell, right? Uh, <laughs> other than our forgetfulness of our divine nature, it's probably the other giant dark spell that is really keeping us on, on our knees in many ways and, and mm -hmm. sort of capping, capping um, our ability as, as human beings to grow and flourish more. Um, at the same time, you know, this crisis point that we're reaching around the world is, is the crisis point that's necessary for any organism to reorganize itself on a higher level so like we wow. kind of have to go through this because otherwise we'd just be plodding along you know patching like saving our money going on vacations and kind of going on the same sort of way but this evolutionary push and i've been seeing lately a lot more like any quote-unquote negative thing that happens or any great uh, calamity in the world always has a dual nature mm. so i'm seeing sort of like i'm mining the gold within all these these situations because clearly like even as i indicated in, in shadow there has to be a collapse initially things have to break down like it just that's that's what i was anticipating too that mm. in the coming years we would have to see that breakdown and that's part of the hero's journey we see this from all of our cultures all around the world our ancestors have mapped it out by virtue of living through it for centuries and millennia and it's part of our psyche is like things when we reach a boiling point and, and of blindness confusion etc it all has to come down and through that coming down, we have to renegotiate our contracts, mental unconscious contracts that we've made with the things around us. So what is my contract with the banking system? What is my contract with uh, the lenders or like, you know, with, just with these huge institutions? Well, if I look deep within myself, I've had to unearth like s some sort of subservience and some sort of like confusion or incompetence in, in terms of all these like great forces that are constantly dictating things in a language that I don't understand. How do I reclaim my power and how do I actually claim 
the ability and the knowledge and the felt sense that I am in charge of myself and actually competent enough to gather resources for me, my family, and my my community without relying on these superstructures. So if so I think it goes down to even if we are to reorganize, you know, the usury system and all that, and it will be abolished and it will fall. Like that's just I'll just I'll just claim that. I'll put my flag down. I'll be like, that will happen. Um, it will. It will. Yeah, it will. Um, but even if it does, you know, if we are not changing internally, if we're not renegotiating those, our view of reality and all these superstructures and our connection to them and our subservience, the way the children, uh, you know, relate to their parents, to an abusive parent, for instance, if we don't renegotiate that, we'll enter another abusive relationship. So mm. here's the macro and the micro, micro and the macro. And so well, what this, this, this opportunity is, is, is asking of us is, you know, the, the, the reflex of the unconscious human is to just beg the, these authorities to fix things and change them back to how they were so we can just keep going. Mm -hmm. And I get that because I have those impulses in me too, right? I, I, and But at the same time, that just goes back to the same old. But I think the challenge here and the opportunity and the invitation is how do we mature so that we're out of our abusive abusive parent's shadow and we actually grow in strength, ability, resources, and and, and in new ways of of doing this commerce thing or 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 just recalibrating or, or or seeking old ways that work that were buried you know that that exists too yeah um so so it's kind of like purging the mind virus building confidence um through experience through moving in the world and 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 you know some of the some of the things that you said the five the five presets you know, there's a, I don't know if enthusiasm was one of them, but virility, yeah. all these aspects are like just collecting more energy, the will to, the will to live and to, to experiment with our realm. And anyway, I think I'll, I'll pause there. What did you experience in Peru from, you know, on what you were just talking about, like new ways of trade, new ways of, what did you see there? Well, yeah, I wish I experienced something uh, very interesting, but I experienced, I was in a town that had, you know, some expats and Westerners and still was, you know, I, I wasn't bartering or working, unfortunately, with the people I was, I was trading for fiat. I was, you know, giving them my fiat for products. Mm -hmm. But what I saw in the communities is they have a, they have a system there in the, in the communities, which is much, it's much more communal. Um, and it's, of course, it's not like, you know, like the deadly, deadly ways of communism, but it, it has to do with respecting nature. Of course, uh, we see this with a lot of people of the earth, knowing that no one thing is really owned, but it's, it's with, through this togetherness, it is worked on. It is, um, uh, you, everyone is a steward of, of, of the, the mystery of Pachamama, which is, you know, the, the word for for nature for god for the divine divine goddess of earth of, of matter and um being a custodian and being um in a way working with her working with with the greater forces and to be honest i i can intellectually speak about it but i think for for people like me living in the west and in fact again in many places in the world I don't know what that lived experience is like to relate to my environment in this way because I have grown up relating to my environment as a consumer, as someone who trades things with others, who is separate from others, who is in a way adversarial to others on the highway, in my car, walking through downtown. Mm. You know, there's just a different um, neural network of relations that I've established. So I think this too is something I'm working on. And I think many of us will be working on is how do we renegotiate our, our, um, uh, yeah, yeah, we're just relation to the outside world, to how we, what what ownership is too. That's it's a very interesting thing, by the way. I just want to touch upon this because we know what happens when ownership is abolished. That's a very dangerous thing. At the mm. same time, here's this conundrum and something we have to resolve at a higher level. We have these two opposites, right? Owning everything and privatizing everything and commercializing everything, commodifying all natural life, is completely harmful uh short-sighted you know dangerous and it's you know it's very bad for all of us at the same time there are forces who are seeking to own everything while uh trying to get us to forfeit our ownership um and live in a sort of com in a subverted 
uh, degenerate communal way, which is not actually the real communal way. So, mm. so within these topics, it's very important that we start distinguishing things because the false binary, as you know, between capitalism and communism is something that, you know, they, they can just keep, they, those forces can just keep bouncing back and forth. But there's something there that we need to uh, really resolve in a more mm. mature way. Yeah. Well, that's a dialectic, isn't it? It's like you, it you're given two choices. It's either communism or liberal democracy with capitalism. And it's like, well, what about everything that came before both of those? It's also it's this idea of progress that the human being is at the best point it is, that has ever been. And that's absolute rubbish. Because, I mean, if you look at the buildings of the ancients, or not, you don't even have to go that far back. But if you look at the buildings from, I mean, my ancestors in particular, like the Taj Mahal, I mean, that is an architectural gem. Th that came from culture. That came from, you know, the knowledge of how to build, the knowledge of how to uh, work with marble and create this beautiful calligraphy and, and build this magnificent palatial tomb and you cannot say that the human being that can build these massive glass buildings is 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 better now than then i mean okay of, at the same time it was is you can't compare beauty with beauty but to think that the human being right now is at the highest point that they've ever been i think is absolute rubbish mm -hmm. Because yeah, the human being at its highest form is when he's completely in tune with the human's human nature, and by extension, because the human is part of nature, with greater nature, and the animal kingdom, and, and this, and that, and the earth, and the, the seas, and the air, and all the different elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. If I may jump on that, I absolutely agree. I think we, in our what i imagine us being at a higher level of functioning is being in tune knowing and understanding the forces of nature and of creation and playing with them contributing to them and weaving more harmony in this created realm so that we use our creativity and in a way that's harmonious with everything else thus opening mm. to divine inspiration but also that being filtered through our own creative centers and then there's this beautiful dance where we're not sort of like building aberrant cancerous structures and i don't mean architect just architecturally mm, yeah. um, because we don't understand the natural forces and we can't flow with them or we're just simply afraid of being annihilated by them um because we're not we don't have the capacity to embody them uh instead we we move with it and we build and we extend in a way we really do um do open up the kingdom right the divine embodiment on, in this world and sort of like bring it to a higher octave where we are I'm sort of the appendages of god on earth mm. and, and through opening more to that inspiration understanding it we uh we participate i don't think we're not insignificant ants on this earth i think we're we're actually beings with a with a great mission and while we can embody the lowest existence the most wretched existence we can also embody the highest one um, mm. And the other, I mean, what distinguishes the human creature from all the other animals is our ability to communicate. I mean, and, and, and language itself, and whether that's spoken language, or if you start going higher up to other means of communication, and like in particular, my, um, what I'm really exploring at the moment is Western classical music, and its ability to convey oh this is something that i found i, I read the other day which was beautiful is that the cla western classical music at its highest is able to convey the idea of the feeling itself right so mm -hmm. where if i take a step back where all other art forms show i mean I'll get, the shadow of the thing the music is the thing itself mm -hmm. so it is the feeling so like last week i was at the royal albert hall in london and there was a performance of bach's b minor mass and all i can say is that the abdallah that entered the royal albert hall 
was not the same as the Abdullah that left. And what I experienced and what that piece of music does is it takes you and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. And while you're sitting there just experiences, experiencing this thing, it's kind of like it's just raising you up, raising you up, raising you up. And at the end of the third movement, it just takes you like beyond and you just your whole body has just got um, like pins and needles, for like the entire body. And then it kind of comes down and then it opens the door for the last movement, which is just the, you know, awe of what's in front of you and it was it i experienced that which was the music communicating something which is in itself spontaneous because you're not think you it bypasses your thinking faculties it just goes straight in it's in the music itself it's in that frequency or that resonance that just resonates within you and you can't not feel it it's just Boom, it's there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. That's that's fascinating. That's very true. Yeah, it's a very good uh very good insight. Um you're definitely making me want to check out the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that because I haven't had an experience like this in a couple of years, actually pre-COVID, to be wow. to the, the symphony. Very, very cool. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's Bach's B minor mass. It's like two and a half hours long. It's long, but you have to listen to it live as well. It's, it's one thing lis listening to a reproduction of it is great and still has the beauty of it. But when you listen to it live with the orchestra, it's like the energy, you you feel it. You, you feel the feeling that Bach, what, 300 years ago was trying to tell people? It's like you've got mm -hmm. to feel the divine. It's real and you can feel it and you can mm -hmm. experience that. And then, I mean, so that was Bach. And then if you go later to the likes of Beethoven and then Wagner, you know, took it even further. But it was this, the idea of the music being able to convey a message. And when you listen to Beethoven, he is, I mean, especially the, the, the Fifth Symphony, he's saying like, you know, you have to want to be free, you know, and it, and it's like coming through and it's just reiterating it and reiterating it and reiterating it. And I mean, Beethoven went through so much difficulty. And I mean, he was in Austria and Germany at the time of the Napoleonic Wars and Napoleon was crossing across Europe. And I mean, he was creating these pieces of music that screaming at people, you know, you don't fall into this trap be free <laughs> oh. yeah yeah i, I love I that i'm so sorry <laughs> go on no and i just think that um and i i never knew about any of this i always thought that classical music was for old people you know growing up like it was only old people that went to listen to classical music and i'm like trying to get all the young people that i know to like just experience it listen to it because it's, it does something to you and there's yeah. a, and and these guys were giants i mean they and giants geniuses and like they had a very deep inward reality mm -hmm. that they were able to express through their music and it's it's really um yeah man it's inspiring and it just yeah gives you that yearning for freedom and that yearning to know yourself and that yearning for the divine and that just that enthusiasm and that passion and it it all happens spontaneous spontaneously yeah yeah totally and brought into the waves sort of being introduced to the divine as you're saying mm. there and then in the moment as these acoustic waves sonic waves move through you as as you know emanations in a harmonic harmonic patterns of of the divine and yeah it's a beautiful thing these these people were artists in the grandest sense and not just artists like mystics and uh oh yeah re really embodying the signal and bringing it down it's yeah very very admirable and then what wagner did is then he took that to another level with his opera dramas where he's drawing he's taking like themes from german mythology and putting them into this and 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 adjusting the story of the myth to suit the time that he was in 
and then on top of all of that is putting the most magnificent music which is conveying the feeling of the message that he's trying to get people to understand mm. and then putting that all together in a 16 hour long four part opera saga which is just absolutely monumental <laughs> you know and it's like yeah. ah it's amazing and it's like and, yeah. and these giants have almost I don't want to say they've been forgotten because they haven't but their work I feel is not appreciated on mass as it should be today. Yeah. Because we need yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, part of me feels like uh, a lot of us are not available. Our inner landscape is so littered. There's so much static and busyness in it that it's almost less available for for their work to land and touch us. Um that doesn't mean that it can't obviously. I'm, I just feel like there's a there's just a frantic energy within a lot of people where something about the truthfulness of their of this work i think touches upon the untruthfulness of our inner being and if we're not used to feeling that we sort of reflexively flee it so if if wow. it were hiding or anything you know living inauthentically then high art can touch us in a way where we reflexively don't want to do anything with it because that means work <sighs> amazing and then there's and and with that comes a rejection mm -hmm. because you don't want to face that you don't even want to experience that because it's it's fearful yeah no, it's, it's, you're afraid of it it's yeah scary. and then we go back to the to the equivalent of the fast food of a popular culture right it's just it stimulates the lowest aspects of our being are like just these addictive patterns within our biology and and it's sort of a prison a sensual prison of of low quality any everything <laughs> mm. oh wow fascinating yeah yep the dopamine fix yeah yeah delicious dopamine fix indeed the 10 symphonies you read it so i mean the, the, there's things that i'm talking about which a lot of that inspiration came from that book what stood out to you in that book was there anything in particular that you were like wow Yes, yeah, yeah. The dedication of um Gorka Konig, yeah, just the way that 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 he was portrayed uh was very inspiring to me. Just just his vision, um uh, some some of the psychoanalysis that of, of his formative psychology, of his intentions, of why he wanted to do what he wanted to do, which then sort of deepened into an actual passion that was rooted in in a deep, honest yearning for truth. Mm. Um a refining of of his art which is a very complex art and not only that but using the art as a vehicle of the divine but also of philosophical inquiry and inspiration it's like it's almost like too much to handle like the the amount of artistry that was described in that was was yeah. was was incredibly stimulating for me uh, because i i really can really resonate with these um huge sagas and, and 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 huge huge sort of mythological movements uh within storytelling that 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 inspired the audience to sometimes even change the culture uh mm. almost to, to 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 bring it to a new baseline and um yeah i think also the alienation that 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 he and his family felt him his father and his partner felt mm. um was was very interesting because it just showed that the, the integrity and the willingness to stay by your truth and not be submerged into the fallen world with all of its cheap, um, cheap adulations, cheap taps on the back, and uh, for in return for kneeling down to some perverted ideology, which is what a lot of our world stands on. Oh, I love that. And and lastly, if I may share, was um, his wife's. I think it was the last, no, the second last chapter was um, kind of like a, an, an interview with his wife. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. she broke broke down um, just her view on, 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 I think it was basically she was outlining the apex of, of, of the, fami the family's uh, philosophy and where psychotherapy uh, stood with that and tying it up with, with Nietzsche. That was very interesting too. And, and her, 
think in the last answer, the last paragraph was her solution or her offering to what the way forward is, which was very important. Mm. And uh, I, I remember that. I can't really, to be honest, recall exactly its contents, but I know I have it underlined and I will reread it. I know that that was, I, I read that. I'm like, yes, that is, that is on point. The man that and like, woman that come together and are not yeah. interested in the plastic palaces right is that the line yes that, that yeah. one exactly that yeah, one I, yeah i can't yeah, quote yeah. it exactly but I, I i know where it is yeah i mean I mean, but you see and that so i'd read that book and i'm watching your in shadow and at the end you know you've got this man and this woman coming together and joining in unison and connecting to the higher faculties and connecting to the earth below and you know it's like it's so visual it's amazing <laughs> and i'm a, i'm a visual person so i've become a little mm. bit more audio now podcasting and having to actually like listen and also with my journey with music and having to actually just focus on my audio faculties but my primary sense is visual and that piece mm -hmm. is like you've got the visual and you've got the audio and it's all just building up and that climax yeah yeah no uh, um that climax it took me some time to get get to into how how i wanted to finish the short and it sort of showed itself to me but yeah it was very important for me to have a uh, man and woman standing together uh in their dignity and their glory and their strength Mm. Um, you know, as, as erect pillars of, of, of what it means to be the divine existing in a human form within this biology of raising the patterns of biological life up through spirit and connecting the higher realm to the lower realm and being that conduit, this mm. honorable work, the great work, right, of awakening matter and rejoining it back to the oneness, to the monad mm. and, 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 and embodying and living this mystery um in the highest way possible but also esoterically as you know everything has to have an esoteric <laughs> angle it's also the union between the masculine and feminine the polar yeah. opposites uh the the go and flow the chaotic and chaos and order within each one of us within which within our own being and harmonizing those two the polarity between good and evil those two coming together in a higher order and and it's in that alchemical union that the new man, the new child, is born uh, with with a great divine innocence. And that innocence is not weakness; it's just a purity, which can mm. see all, which 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 has all in it. And um, that was that was kind of my wish and my message to um, the the game that we're playing and, and its potential and, and where it's headed. I think mm. <laughs> maybe you know who knows when. Yeah, but I mean, you you you're bringing back thoughts in my mind of Wagner's Ring Cycle, the Ring of the Nibelung, and it charters three generations. It's the middle generation, the loving couple, the couple that have this amazing meeting and this love affair, and it's their son that goes on to become the hero as he grows up. Mm. And what Wagner does in the music, the music of their coming together, the spirituality of it, the love that comes and creates this child. And is that child is the child of that love that goes on to then, you know, end up being the, well, even he's not actually the hero, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a long saga and there's lots yeah. of it, but, <laughs> but it no, is absolutely. That, the child of love has love yeah 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 and i know imagine a world of children like that i wonder if, <laughs> what that would be like but yeah the union it's 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 a fascinating meeting when when two people because for us to meet with another human being um in 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 such closeness it's such authenticity in such a real way it requires of us to be so clear and and aware of our own impulses of our inner world so that we can allow the other to touch us deeply inside right when we have mm. all the neurotic aspects that many of us do in terms of relation, uh, when our pain and hurt is touched in a way that we don't like, we react in all these wild ways. And most of us do this all of our lives. Mm. So to come in in pure love is quite a feat. It's quite an achievement and quite a quite quite a cosmic um, episode. So yeah, Wagner was was correct in, in highlighting that in such a triumphant way because it is the triumph. And, and as Rumi, yeah. you know, 
says and with many of his practices of like looking in the eyes of the beloved whether yeah. that's a friend or, or or a loved one we see the the greater beloved you know the exactly uh exactly. the one that moves through us all and yeah. with the clarity of the, the clear windows to the soul so yeah it's a triumphant moment for sure well you mentioned rumi and i did an episode on rumi with a scholar from san francisco no he's from afghanistan but he lives in san francisco and he's a scholar in Rumi and he he like knows it all off by heart and he could just like repeat lines in the in the Farsi itself it was absolutely magnificent and at the end of it he recounted I don't think it's Rumi but it's like a it's a it's a Persian saying and it is agar dil she nadri safare ishq ranakon which means if you don't have the heart of a lion don't travel on the path of love and it was just, oh, it was so amazing. Wow. So if you don't have the heart of the lion, don't travel on the path of love. Because if you want to travel that, you need the, the courage to love. I agree. Yes, that's, that's beautiful. That's so powerful. Absolutely the courage to love. Yes, the courage to love all who even seem unlovable or, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really when we love everyone every when we love we are gifting reality we're mm. bringing in god we're we're elevating that which we see which we love and yeah with the ego gets in in the way and says no why should i they're not worthy or they why should i love them like you know finding fault in creation then mm. we may, maintain the separation and lack the flow of the divine but i love that saying that's that's beautiful mm. yeah. tell me do you have a life coach? I don't, no. I don't. Who has been your biggest guide on your journey? Who has been? I mean, the, the many pages of books, I guess, have been my guide. Um, I have used entheogens or psychedelics to guide me in certain episodes of my life. Right. Uh, you know, psilocybin mushrooms and uh, mostly have been have, have made me reach uh, kind of like new new realizations and of course I've worked on a lot of integration of that um, someone that has helped me on my journey has been Neil Kramer he's a he's a British man he lives in the United States okay and he he's been uh, he's been an ally I've, I've, I've worked with him in person and uh, uh, mostly been benefiting just from his his talks. He does Rome casts, uh, which are just these podcasts as he walks around. He 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 shares <laughs> his ruminations. Um, oh. But yeah, yeah, and in, that's that's kind of been it. No, unfortunately, I don't have. Yeah, I don't have major mentors, which I I feel would have been great, and I'm still open to that. Uh, mm. Perhaps part of me was not humble enough to accept one, uh, which is regrettable. Uh, but humility is something I'm working on daily, and and it's, yeah, I'm just so we'll we'll see. Well, no, I was just curious because I mean, I, I I lived with my sheikh, Sheikh Doctor Abdul Qadir Sufi, who is Ian Dallas. So he was born Ian Dallas, and he became Muslim in the 1960s, and he's the man that wrote the book, The Ten Symphonies of Gorka Koenig. I mean, he was my, he was a great mentor and my sheikh and my kind of guide. Sheikh Abdul Qadir was a huge figure in my life. And, and I was just wondering if you, if you had somebody that was really like a, a, a guide or someone that, that took you along the path, or if you've just, you've, you've found it by yourself almost. Yeah, made by myself on the material realm, but um, you know, who knows how I'm being guided in other ways. So I, I don't know. But I'll tell you, like, as you were saying that something came to me, which is, it's not so much a guide, but one thing reflecting on, on my journey in the last 10 years, one thing that's really helped me expand more has, has been letting go of the personality structure uh, quality that I had of being right or trying to prove to people that I knew and that came mm. from you know certain other f formational kind of wounding in which I had to prove worth through yeah. knowledge and competence and 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 there was um there was suffering with that but there was also a sense of righteousness and also a t holding tight to information that may not have been complete and and then recognizing that and letting it grow go gradually 
I've been able to accommodate and hold a lot more um, information that, that is contradictory many times, that is incomplete. And by doing so, I think there's been a softening where now there was a there was a lot more information that was available to me because I wasn't discarding it. Because, uh, you know, I wasn't rejecting it outright because it mm. was contrary to my identity and something about that softness and broadness of holding more things, I think has allowed for just for more, I think more maturity, if I may say, um, and being, yeah, some, something about that, some, something about going again into humbleness and to humility of, I don't know, and that's okay. And my worth is not dependent on knowing. But mm. ironically, it's through that that more knowing comes in because it's only through that state the real knowing comes in. Uh, it's all in the opposites, isn't it? It's like you've got to not know in order to know. <laughs> yeah, totally. And you've got to, totally. to not do in order to do. Yeah. Amazing. Do you speak Farsi, by the way? Like, I mean, you, as you quoted that, but do you, are you fluent in Farsi? Or? No, not at all. No, I okay. speak a little bit of Urdu. So my mother is Pakistani. So um, okay. she never really spoke to us in Urdu, but like my grandparents would speak in Urdu. And so I, I did, you know, like it's weird because yeah. I can, I can, I don't know, it's the, I can distinguish the words. So if someone speaks to me in Urdu, I know which ones, this is a word, this is a word, this is a word, but I yeah. can't translate it and I can't tell you what it means. I just get the gist of the meaning um, mm -hmm. and I can't speak it, but I'm, I, I did start learning. I'd because the the Urdu poetry is just like it is just intoxicating it is intoxicating and there's one um there's this type of music called kawali which is where they sing songs in praise of of the divine basically and it's and it's to open like with the music that we were talking about it's you know it's accompanied by harmo um i can't remember what the actual word for the instrument is but it's kind of like played with a pian like piano keys and it has like a um like a bag that drives the air through it it's kind of like a hum harmonic harmonium ah oh, i don't know the word of it anyway and then with the drums and then you have these singers which are singing these songs but they are they are themselves the living embodiment of the spiritual reality that they want the people to feel. So there are songs about intoxication, you know, and they're just talking about like the intoxication and they're just, they are themselves intoxicated and they're singing about intoxication so that everyone there who's listening to it is experiencing this same intoxication. And the way that the songs are sung is like they start very, mellow almost and they build up and they build up and they build up and they're like communicating this thing is like know that the divine is real know it feel it experiencing it i'm telling you it's real like just experience what i'm experiencing as it's magnificent and then the words and the poetry is like the highest would do and wow. it's it, it's I'll send I'll send you a a, a couple of um, yeah I was gonna say I'd love it if you send me some please but specific ones that hand picked ones that I like <laughs> wonderful nicely curated by you that's wonderful <laughs> with the ones that also have the um, translation which is never gonna uh, portray the exact message but it's yeah, yeah you'll still you'll get the gist of what the man's singing about as he's going into this kind of like intoxicated state um, yeah wonderful. Kawali. Yeah, I, I love it. The, uh, so, oh, yeah, one thing I did want to ask you is what's next? What What are you working on? So um, I just finished a short film, which is part of an anthology, six directors, six stories. Um, wow. Each one is, is based on a folktale. Um, they're Russian folktales. Um, wow. And they're all complete right now. So my episode is complete. I'd love to share it with you, but we don't have distribution yet. Yeah. Um, it's not, I'm not, you know, that's the, um, that's up yeah, to yeah. the producers, but there's some, mm. yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, that, that hopefully will be released somewhere for, for, for people to see. Right. Um, it has to do with uh, the great reset, virtual reality, and soul harvesting, and um, the standardization of human beings. So this is wow. a, like it's, it's an 18 minute short, um, I, I wrote and directed it, so I'm, I'm happy with it. 
Right. Uh, it wasn't wasn't an easy year to do. Most of it was done in, well, while I was in Peru. That's where I finished okay. it up. Did the final cut. You know, we did the score and stuff there. And um, yeah, so so that's that's one thing. I have another little short that I've been kind of rough and quite gritty that I've been working on the side. I may or may not release it. I'm not sure if it's worth it or not. We'll see. It, it was mm-hmm. meant as a it was meant as a real kind of like call to inspire the troops so to say uh to really instill some like real vigor in in people within Mm. a time of challenge so um that may come out and and the next thing that i'm doing right after uh my i'm helping some friends right now in one of their movies but uh when i'm done that i'm gonna take a sabbatical and finish a screenplay i've been working on for some time it's about Mm. transhumanism uh pop culture celebrity culture and what it means for the organic and synthetic worlds to clash and why the synthetic world uh in, infects man's minds and, and seeks to dominate the organic world and how the organic world triumphs through that through um in the ingenuity of spirit uh the spirit within a human being so i think it's a very powerful story and wow. I, I, hope, I hope to get it made so yeah sounds awesome man yeah yeah there's just one other thing which is on the subject of time because it's really been a recurring theme this week i just coming back to like the likes of bach and beethoven and mozart and wagner and these giants is they were conveying a message in their time but that message can still be played by an orchestra today and that message goes in spontaneously and it's almost as if it's that message is out of time when it, it goes into you and it, it's out of time this it's like this kind of um amazing i don't know and the other thing that i've been reflecting on this week is that there is no future and there is no past there is only now mm-hmm. and whatever yeah. whatever we're thinking of or our dreams of the future they're a fantasy and even like our memories and what we recall of our past is also a fantasy. It's not real. And that's actually what John Perkins is saying in in that book on dreams from his experience in Peru, because he was saying that you can change you, you, you can change your dream now. So you can change your future and you, but, and the amazing thing was, oh, that was the, that was the amazing thing is he said that if you change your now, you you also change your past. Because your past oh. is just you you you're recalling a memory, but that's not exactly how it was. So you can change what it was and how you remember it. And so if you change yeah. your dream now, you're changing the past and the future. And but you change it now. Yeah, totally. It's all it's like a field that emanates backwards and 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 forward and and, and all dimensions of time and upwards yeah, and really downwards good. and then you've got the tree and then there's the baby and then it's the eyes <laughs> yeah totally i know that a, a temporal quality of, of of reality is is beautiful and um mm. yeah i hope you and i keep keep exploring it in our own ways because it's yeah Absolutely. it is the way yeah Awesome, man. Well, once again, thank you so much. I'm actually going to go listen to, I'm going to go watch In Shadow again. I'm going to nice. watch it right now after this and just like go into a zone. Um, is there anything you want to say? Is there anything else you've got that you'd just like to uh, express or any message or anything that you just want to add in at the end? No, just uh, thank, thank, thank you again. I always love these conversations because it puts me in a concentrated uh, situation uh, where I really have to be accurate and true with what i say so i really appreciate the space thank you for listening the, to the, this episode the, you know, the of the new no more podcast to everyone who's, who has listened i really to this. can't reiterate it thank enough. you for taking the journey go on to youtube strong, follow the link in the episode and, uh, description and watch and watch in, in shadow. shadow you won't regret <laughs> it. watch in shadow it's only 13 <laughs> minutes long and it's absolutely <laughs> epic and it'll put this conversation into perspective And once you've watched it, please do reach out to me. Tell me your thoughts on it and how you see us awakening the wild, spontaneous, enthusiastic, passionate, virile, trusting human being. Thank you.